Welcome to the Work Hard, Play Hard podcast. My name is Rob Murgatroyd, and I'm a former doctor turned lifestyle entrepreneur. Each week, I interview some of the best minds on the planet on the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. Come take this journey with me. Excuses are over. It's time to live. It took a lot of effort. It took a lot of awareness, and it took a lot of constant checking in with myself to continue to push the barriers, become more of who I wanted to be and who I uh, believe I've become. If you only point outward in whatever the situation is, you'll never learn and you're going to continue to repeat those same mistakes and you're going to be continued to put in those same situations until you actually learn. And so everyone wants to know what Steve Jobs has for breakfast and they want to know what the workout schedule of billionaires are and and all the all the other habits. But the most critical reason why those people became billionaires is because they had the resources to grow their business. Okay, before we jump into this interview, I want to invite you to be considered for my 2019 Traveling Mastermind. So go to workhardplayhardmastermind.com and fill out the application and we'll jump on a call to see if you're a great fit. This year, we'll be in Boston doing lots of cool things like training with Tom Brady's trainer, Alex Guerrero. In the middle of the year, we'll be heading to Monaco doing things like vintage car rides through the French Riviera. And then we're going to wrap the year in Florence, Italy, doing things like truffle hunting and hot air ballooning over Florence. Look, Life is all about fulfillment, and I really try and walk the walk. So if you are looking to be part of our tribe of 28 high-achieving entrepreneurs that are in the six- and seven-figure range, fill out your application at workhardplayhardmastermind.com to be considered. So think of the mastermind as having two parts. The first is the trip itself. And the second part is what goes on over the four days within the mastermind. Our group of 28 entrepreneurs will help you brainstorm and accelerate what you want to achieve in 2019. And we'll do that through a variety of different exercises, brainstorming activities, breakout sessions, goal setting sessions, you know the drill. So go to workhardplayhardmastermind.com, fill out an application, and we'll jump on a call to see if you're a fit. All right, let's jump into today's episode. What's up, everybody? This is Rob Murgatroyd, and welcome to another episode of the Work Hard, Play Hard show. This episode features Bill Glazer. You can find him on Instagram and elsewhere at Bill Glazer. I wanted to have Bill on the show because he represents entrepreneurship at a whole new freaking level. He sees opportunities and believes in himself and creates crazy successful exits, but does it in this beautiful, heart-centered way. I learned so much from him. We have a ton in common with each other. We're both born in the same year, in the same city, and we both have a four-year-old daughter. But what I love about Bill is his ability to step into fulfillment in a big way. You are absolutely gonna love this episode. Bill, welcome to the show. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate being here on the podcast with the best voice in podcasts. Oh, you know, listen, flattery is going to get you everywhere, man. You know, I have been looking forward to this for some time because it seems that people that I really, really respect, they all say the same thing to me. They're like, you know, Billy Glazer, right? And I'm like, no, actually, I I met him like one time, but I don't really know. I'm like, oh, you you guys got to meet. And the more I dig into this, the more I understand why they keep saying that. And we're going to talk about that. So thank you for making the time. Well, I, you and I have been hearing the same thing except different names. So I appreciate <laughs> having met you in person and appreciate connecting. And uh, I'm looking forward to when you make the move to Los Angeles where I live and we can get to hang a little bit more. But really great to connect and really great to be on your podcast. Yeah, man, it's coming. It's coming soon. So I thought today what we would do is we would cover your work and a little bit of background there. Talk a little bit about kind of what you do for fulfillment and play in your life. And then we'll wrap up with some rapid fire questions. Cool? Very cool. All right. So I'd like to begin with rewinding the clock a bit 
you were born in the year of our Lord, 1966, which makes oh, us... Oh, you're, you're letting the secrets out, Rob. <laughs> which makes us exactly the same age. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> makes us exactly the same age. And you were raised in New York, as I yes. would, as I was. So can you give me maybe a thumbnail sketch of what it was like growing up for you in New York? In other words... How would you describe your childhood? So my childhood was, I would say, really good and really challenging all at the same time. So I had really loving parents, but I had experiences as I was growing up that forced me or the way I reacted to it when I was younger was by building walls and and cutting myself off and really insulating myself and protecting myself. So I had a lot of experiences where I was bullied. I almost daily was made fun of and often in front of groups of people. And I learned when I spoke up, if it wasn't the way certain people in my life at the time were wanting it to be, that it was wrong. And so I while I had some really great experiences growing up and, um, you know, had a lot of friends and a lot of uh, freedoms even as a, as a child, uh, I also was progressively putting blocks on a wall that I built and built and built. I was really good at uh, childhood construction and, and erecting those walls. And uh, a lot of the experiences I had, I, I essentially withdrew. And I withdrew from interacting with people because I became afraid of uh, speaking up and being blasted, or I became afraid of being made fun of and, and feeling humiliated or shamed or embarrassed in front of people. So for me, progressively, I withdrew and it got to the point where I became agoraphobic. And so I grew up in the suburbs of New York, but I, I didn't really feel like I was a suburban kid. I always felt like I was a city kid. My father worked in the city. I would often go to go to his office in the city uh, I really liked the city, but I was really, really uncomfortable being in crowds. So it was a real dichotomy. So every time I was in the city, I felt the energy. I, I really liked the the, the hustle, the buzz, uh, all the things going on. But internally, I was very, very uncomfortable to the point where if I were in crowds, and whether that was a crowd in New York City or whether that was walking into a store or whether that was in a restaurant with my parents... I would always have this inherent feeling that I was going to be embarrassed or shamed or humiliated. And so I I would try to get out of those situations as as fast as I could. And I would often find myself sweating or being embarrassed and and just, you know, feeling like I, you know, like I wanted to just curl up. It was after I had graduated from college where I started experiencing how those childhood experiences manifested in my life, how it, uh, how I prevented myself from really fully realizing my life and fully realizing myself and held myself back often from having experiences, whether those were in work or personal. And uh, I've done a lot of work over the last many years to overcome those. And I'm now someone that actually feels really comfortable in crowds. I've lived in New York City. I'm, I'm living in Los Angeles now, but it was part of my work to put myself into those things that I feared to overcome those fears and to evolve myself so that I could live really the fulfilled life that I uh, am living now. And uh, it took a lot of effort. It took a lot of awareness and it took a lot of constant checking in with myself to continue to push the barriers, change the habits that I had grown up with and become more of who I wanted to be and who I uh, believe I've become. It's amazing. You know, I have a claustrophobia thing. And as I get older, the claustrophobia gets worse. So I love the fact that you're able to, you know, take agoraphobia and work through it where it's no longer an issue. For me, it's becoming like a, like a really big deal. Like, you know, sometimes like when you live in a high rise and you got (laughs) You got to take an elevator, and every time you go up, you you know you, know, you start to sweat. Mm-hmm. So I love the fact that you were able to overcome that. That's really great. Yeah, it was a conscious thing for me, and so you know when we often walk through life unconsciously or doing things subconsciously based on the conditioning that we had as a child, and so the only way to break 
those patterns or those conditions is to first gain aware, uh, awareness of it. And so for me, I felt the sweat. I felt the, the heat on my face. I felt the discomfort. I felt the desire to just get out wherever I was, where I was uncomfortable because it just had a familiarity that uh, I felt I was going to be in a situation where I was going to be bullied or, or made fun of or, or feel the, the, the embar- embarrassment and the shame and, and the humiliation. And so those were real feelings for me, even though they were my perceptions based on a reality that I lived with growing up and not based on the reality I was actually living when I was experiencing that, that phobia. And so it, it, it first came to me, uh, to be aware that, uh, this is, this is how I developed it. I think it, you know, while no one needs to necessarily be in therapy for the rest of their lives or checking in every day with a therapist, I think it's good to whatever the, whatever the practice is, whether it's self reflection, introspection, meditation, journaling, therapy, whatever it might be. I think it's a really important step to first gain understanding of how that phobia or that fear developed, because without that awareness, you could try to change that behavior by doing new things. But if you're just doing new things for the sake of just trying something different, you you don't address the root cause of where that phobia or that fear came from. So gaining an understanding but not spending too much time living in the past, just enough to realize how that phobia or that fear developed. And then the effort and the the work is on putting yourself in those uncomfortable positions, uh, facing the fear, doing the things that you're afraid of. And only from that action, that work and that effort does that fear or that phobia begin to dissolve. And And it's a progressive thing. It's not just like you snap your fingers and all of a sudden, you're going to, your fear or your phobia is going to go away, but it's constantly doing the work and constantly even checking in with yourself to see how you reacted to the the thing that used to be a trigger. And if it still is a trigger and to check in to see, do I need to spend more time focusing on my fears? Or at some point you just, you, you almost realize that you are the, that, that new behavior is your behavior. It's your, it becomes your second nature and and what you experienced and how it triggered you growing up, uh, is still there and it can still have your buttons pushed if you, if you lose that awareness. So it's always important to keep checking in with yourself and keep doing the work. But progressively, the more you face your fears, the more those fears just dissolve away. I love that. You know, it's so easy to just step into the world of, you know, I I have agoraphobia, I have claustrophobia and, you know, be like Woody Allen on the couch for 20 years. At some point, you got to do the work. So I love I love what you're describing. Now, you were you were a entrepreneur even as a kid. I mean, you were the guy with the lemonade stand, the newspaper route, when you saw something in the magazine, you figured out how you know, how to get it. Where where do you think this entrepreneurial drive came from? Was it your mother, your father, internal? I feel I had a lot of that internally, but I also saw my father. My father was someone who walked the line of being an entrepreneur and liking what he perceived as the security of working for someone else. And so I saw that when he pursued his dreams, he was most happy. And when things got more challenging, he would often seek the security and the comfort of working for someone else and, and having that perception that that salary is fixed and it doesn't come with the stresses of being an entrepreneur. And I saw how my father walked that line. And so I had kind of an innate entrepreneurial mindset, even as a kid, like you're pointing out. I mean, I, I wanted to get a magic kit desperately when I was five years old and I literally walked door to door selling greeting cards and vegetable seeds to earn the points, not the money, but the points to then convert that into that magic kit that I wanted. And so it's kind of interesting because I have a almost six-year-old daughter and I was telling her recently that when I was her age, I was walking door to door making sales and I was we were, we were talking about money and I was giving her a lesson about money. But it, it also struck me how there's no way I would let my daughter walk door to door <laughs> to, to, by herself at, at five years old. So things have changed a little bit. But yeah, I had this innate entrepreneurial inherent drive, I believe, but also from seeing my father and seeing how he walked that line 
I, I learned to become more of a risk taker. And, and the irony is I just described how uh, I was this withdrawn kid that uh, kept myself back from having experiences. But when it came to business, uh, I dove in and I dove in early and I, and I took risks. I, it was later in my life that I began to take those same risks in my personal life and, and all aspects of my life. But uh, as, a, as an entrepreneur, I was always a risk taker. What did you think you were going to be in high school? In high school, I wanted to be an architect. I was really good at drawing and uh, also at math. So I actually even explored going to architectural school and I used to design buildings and, and even city scenes. And so I, I had this real strong interest in doing that. But I also, when I began to even visit the schools, it, it, the, that life of sitting at a desk and while I, I, I consider myself a really creative person and, and the ability to express that creativity would have been there for me as an architect, but I didn't feel that the lifestyle or the day-to-day of sitting at a desk and sitting in front of a computer and, and doing the same thing over and over again, even though each project would be different, was really the thing that was going to drive me. And so I, I felt I needed more challenges and I feel I felt that that lifestyle or that profession, while I had certain interest in it and I had certain abilities for it, wasn't the right thing for my personality. Do you think that the architecture background that you had, you sort of have applied into businesses? In other words, the way you architect businesses and the way you look at numbers, that's sort of like natural affinity. Yeah, that's a really interesting perspective. And I, and I, I haven't thought of it from that perspective before, but I, I think that that is the case because when I start a business, I have a plan. And if, if you don't have a plan and you don't know where you want to go, you're not going to get there. Or if you do get there, it's going to take you a lot longer and uh, cost you a lot more money. I, I, you know, when a plane takes off going from New York to Los Angeles, it has a flight plan. And it knows where it's going. It knows what the weather forecast is. It knows uh, how many planes are in the sky. There are always things along the way that you have to adapt to and you have to address. If there's a tornado that comes out of nowhere, the, the plane's going to have to navigate to avoid being in the, in the, in the storm. And uh, the same thing when you start a business. You have to have a plan or otherwise you're just winging it and winging it isn't something that is a, is a strategy. And so having the strategy to build something, because like being an architect and building a building, a business requires the first starting with where you're going, then building the foundation. And then once you have the foundation built, then you could build the layers on top of that business and, and then, you know, end up with the shiny exterior that looks so good. But, you know, most people don't see what it took to get to that shiny exterior. So I I really like that analogy. And it's been something that, Uh, the way I've approached starting a company and growing a company and uh, the patience to go from idea to foundation to the guts to ending up with that shiny exterior is and and the perseverance to to get to that point uh, are are definitely similar to what it takes to build a building. So I, I really like that. Well, let's bounce around a little bit. I want to go back to college. So you went to Ithaca, uh, mm. which is upstate New York, and you decided that you wanted to throw your hat into the financial ring. So you jumped into a job uh, or you got a job at JP Morgan, um, but then you quit like after the first day. <laughs> Can you kind of walk us through that one? Yeah. Well, I appreciate the research you've done and you've, you've nailed it. So yeah, I, when I was in high school, I actually had an affinity uh, for investing. And so I, it, that started for me where uh, literally my grandparents had bought me, I don't remember how many shares, but it was a, it was a minor amount of stock in AT&T and I believe IBM as well. And those were you know two companies that back then uh, were considered dinosaurs. And now they're, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, reaping the uh, the oil from those dinosaurs. They've been around so long, but but they were what were considered really conservative companies that grew year over year, and you just bought those stocks and you held them. And so that that sparked my interest in uh, investing. And I actually had a, a class in high school that we created a mock portfolio, and we were able to trade our stocks and and buy and sell different stocks and. Uh, it was during the time where the stock market 
was more stagnant. And uh, during that time on my mock portfolio, I was making money. So I really had an interest in investing at that time. And so when I went to college, I was a finance major, economics minor, and I was interviewing for jobs when I was graduating. And as you mentioned, took a job at JP Morgan, which uh, ultimately merged with Chase. And it was a job that was a really great entry level position something that you know from my parents perspective was you know the, the, their boy went to college he, he got this degree now now he's got this great job and they were happy i wasn't happy i didn't like the career trajectory of starting at the bottom even with a great opportunity and and rising through someone else's corporate hierarchy to reach what would be considered the pinnacle of success by rising up through a company and uh, progressively becoming, you know, uh, in some leadership role. That wasn't all that appealing to me. I, I was someone that as a kind of an entrepreneurial driven person, I wanted to be paid for my effort. And while I wanted to learn, and I think there's a lot of value from getting into a company and learning from the bottom and, and learning all of the, the aspects of what it goes, what, what goes into some, uh, a, a really great product or service company and learning and understanding every aspect of that business. Uh, for me, I wanted to I wanted to be able to achieve success as soon as possible, and I, and, and at those days, I was also more materially driven as opposed to doing things that were consistent with my values and and consistent with what I wanted to do every day. I, at, at those days, I just wanted to make money, and so I I then be, I got into fight. I actually the day I was supposed to start the job at J.P. Morgan, uh, I, I got on a bus from the suburbs to go into New York City. And I was thinking about it for a while and I was contemplating it. And I just, it, it just, in, in the core of my being, it wasn't the right fit for me. And so while, while I was on the bus going into New York City, I called the human resources manager and I said, I really appreciate the opportunity, but it's not the right fit for me and I'm, I'm not going to take it. And that's after I had already accepted it. Needless to say, when I got home and I told my parents what I had done, they, they were really, really disappointed. And how could I have given up such a great opportunity? And how could I uh, have gone to school for four years and, and got this degree and all of a sudden you're, you're wasting it? And what are you going to do now? And wh- what is your, what's your next step? And you know, how are you, you, you going to make money? And all these, all these fears that they were projecting. And for me, while I was living at their home at the time, I knew that I wanted to do something different. And so while I was hearing that, chatter that was inconsistent with what I wanted to do, I, I also pursued what I wanted to do. And so I, I had this affinity for finance, but I also wanted to get paid for my efforts. So I got into financial sales. I was a financial advisor at a uh, large investment bank in New York. And uh, I became, I was the number two person in the sales training uh, that I went to at the company. And the number one uh, had inherited her book of business from her father who worked at the same company. So I was feeling pretty good about myself. I was making more money than my friends from college did, including my friends that became, at the time, it was the big eight accounting. Now there's big four. And so I, w- I was feeling pretty good about myself because I was comparing how much money I was making to my friends and feeling like that was an accomplishment. Later in life, uh, I realized that that wasn't the thing that I wanted to measure myself against other people about. And th- that was just um, more superficial and uh, not meaningful. But at the time, those were the things that I thought were important, making a lot of money, having material possessions, and being a winner among my peers. Yeah, I want to get into that. Before we do, though, your eye for... It's interesting because you've got a... um, You've got an eye for things like we talked about math and architecture, et cetera. But you also have an eye, like a really interesting entrepreneurial eye. Like, for example, in the 90s, you know, at the heart of the Gulf War, you see a demand for U.S. flags and you decide, I'm going to start a business selling flags. So, you know, in three weeks, you have a million bucks in orders, but you never actually wound up selling a flag. So can you tell us like what happened there and maybe, you know, through the lens of what that experience taught you? I began to look at how can I get an inventory of flags that I could sell them in what was a hot market where there was a lot of demand, but there was a short supply. And so I, I researched and I found 
all of the materials that were used in making U.S. flags, the certain type of fabric, the certain dowels, the, the wooden sticks for the handheld flags, all the materials, I sourced them out. Uh, I found a silk screening printer in California, and I contracted with them to make the flags. While I was doing that, I began to sell the flags, and I did a very simple marketing campaign where at the time, uh, it's, it's akin to email marketing, but it was fax marketing, where I sent out a mass fax that was very simple and direct. It said, we have U.S. flags in big letters, and it had the terms, and a, a very short period of time, like you mentioned, in three weeks, I got a million dollars worth of orders. And I was on top of the world, and I felt like you know, that I could do no wrong. And, and I, you know, that million dollars in the first three weeks was going to become tens of million do- of, of dollars in, you know, the next few months. And one of the chain stores that ordered those flags, it was a um, drugstore chain in the Midwest. They had actually placed one order and then a week later they placed the second order. So they were, they were my biggest company ordering these flags. And so they were the first one that I was going to fulfill. So I, told the the silk screener in California that was printing the flags and then assembling them to send me a sample box before they sent them out to this drugstore chain. Wanted to make sure the quality was what they were expecting. And then uh, the plan was to to fulfill all the other orders. So I get this box that they sent me. I opened the box enthusiastically, so excited about where my future is going and how this business is going to make all these millions of dollars. I open up the box and I take out the first flag and the fabric is cut unevenly. The red that they used in the American flag was fluorescent. There was glue all over the sticks. And it was really one of those situations that everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. And to get to that point also, I needed money. And at the time, I didn't know how to raise money. I've since become a prolific money raiser in businesses that I founded as well as helping other companies raise money. And I went to my father. And when I had these million dollars, or even before I had the million dollars, when I had some of the purchase orders starting to come in, uh, and I knew I needed the the money to buy the inventory, I went to my father. Uh, and my father wasn't a wealthy man, uh, but he wanted to support his his kids. And so he loaned me some money. And then as the order started getting bigger and the need for capital became bigger, so did the, the loans. And it was an uncomfortable situation for my father, but I kept telling him how great this opportunity is and how I'm going to make so much money. And I never told him anything about the risk because I didn't even have the, the wisdom or the experience to know about the risk. And so I just gave him this rosy picture. He loaned the money. When the glue is sticking to my hands and I'm showing my father everything that happened, and telling him that uh, your your all that money that you just invested is has just evaporated, and uh, it, it's 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 all over the the fluorescent red on the on the uh, on the flags and the glue on the sticks and all this crap that your money turned into over time. That was not only a great experience for me to learn from uh, a standpoint of how to plan and build a business like we were just talking about but also how to raise money from friends and family, how to set proper expectations, how to not only sell the opportunity, but the risk and and how when you're going to friends and family, your friends and family should completely understand not only all the good things that can happen, but all of the bad things that can happen and be prepared to lose all their money. You know, as much as that probably sucked at the time, what a blessing in terms of a lesson moving forward in your life, yeah? Without a doubt. And that's the only way you could really learn. I mean, you you don't learn by just studying from a book. You don't learn from seeing other people. Those things can certainly help, but you need experiences um, to learn from. And you need experiences that you're open to, to learning from. Because if you just have experiences and you're not willing to look at them and you just point outwardly about saying, well, they fucked up or they suck or they were the emotionally unavailable person in the relationship and uh, you know the next one's going to be better. If you, if you only point outward in whatever the situation is, whether it's in business, whether it's in personal life, you'll never learn and you're going to continue to repeat those same mistakes and you're going to be continued to put in those same situations, which like you said, are opportunities to learn from until you actually learn. 
Well, you know, this is interesting because now you you take those lessons and before you start a new business, you've made a distinction between asking yourself if this is going to help people or is it just going to make money like you started with in the beginning. And if it doesn't make, if it only makes money, then you drop it. What were the steps that ultimately led you to get to that way of thinking? So like I said earlier in my 20s, when I began my business career, I was very materialistic. And so I, I was motivated to make money. I was motivated how I was going to spend that money. Uh, I went through what I thought at the time was the checklist of what most 20 something year old guys want to have. And I ended up, you know, with the 911 convertible and the gold watch and the, the, the best stereo and, uh, the, the manager of the Armani store coming to my office with the tailor and fitting me for custom suits at my place and all of the trappings of feeling like those were the things that were successful. And so I was living this life where those were the way I, I got my self worth, where I, or, or where I felt I thought I was getting my self worth. Those were the ways that I used to compare myself to other people, and 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 how I felt either good or bad about myself based on what I had and what I didn't have. And then there, there were there were a few experiences that I had that really helped crystallize that that wasn't the path for me. And I, I like nice things, and even now I, I have a lot of nice things, but it's not the nice things aren't what make me who I am. Those are nice for me to have. It, it's who I am as a person, what I do for other people, how I treat other people, how I raise my daughter, how I treat my wife. All of those things are the things that are how I am valued, not only uh, to myself, but to other people. It's it, I, Whether I have a nice car or a nice suit or whatever it is, those don't make the person. Those are just material trappings. And I was caught in that material lifestyle for a while. And so living in Los Angeles, I remember driving into the hills of Beverly Hills and Bel Air and trying to be motivated to see what other people had so I can get the same things. And I remember seeing like these massive mansions, like 40, 50,000 square feet mansions. And I was at a party at one of those. It was a, a billionaire and it was a party for one of his sons. And at this party, I, I saw that they had this uh, room filled with security. And in this room, there were there were there must have been about ten or twelve security guards that that were always on the premises of their house. And I thought to myself, what a what a miserable way to live, where you have this massive house, you know, fifty thousand square foot house for a family of four, and you you have no privacy and you have no freedom, and you're you're kind of trapped in that world, and how. Most of those people with the forty, fifty thousand dollar house, uh, uh, square feet houses, have no need for that space, and it's more of uh, how they're presenting themselves to other people and how that's a, a symbol of status. And I started to to see that, and I started to realize that that's not what I wanted in my life. And it took a lot of work, it took a lot of effort. Uh, I, I went from one extreme of living a material life for a couple of years of being almost uh, living an aesthetic life of you know, not caring about it anything material and, and living more basic. And, uh, and then, you know, I got to a point where, uh, I found my middle ground and I found, you know, the place that makes me happy where I, I feel good about who I am as a person and the things that I do, but not needing those, those nice things. If I want them, if I can afford them, I'm going to have them because I enjoy them, but I don't need them for someone else to judge me in a certain way. I don't need them for me to judge myself in a certain way. Yeah, you know, my prayer is that the 20 and 30 year olds who's listening to this can embrace it because as you're telling that story, I'm going through that same, I call it my douchebag phase um, <laughs> in my life. And it was, you know, I had the 9 11, exactly the same. I built the 10,000 square foot house. I had the guy come into the house to make the suits. And I hit a point in my life, which was the exact same thing, where I realized how much freaking energy I was putting into my life to keep all of these plates spinning, the three cars and the house. And the, and, you know, I had like people living in the house and all of that shit, none of it made me happy. So my prayer is that, you know, you listen to people, the, the 20 or 30 year old that's listening to these two old guys talking right now, <laughs> that they, that they embrace this, that it's so important to come from a you know, a much more heart-centered space. So I love where you are. I like, 
I'd like to talk a little bit about your new company, which is called Outstanding Foods and your newest product under that umbrella, uh, which is Pig Out Chips. Why did you decide to enter into the food space and were you warned against it? So I personally have eaten a plant-based diet for over 28 years. And 28 years ago, from the standpoint of what products were on the market and even the perception of that type of diet, I was essentially a freak. Now, all of a sudden, I'm cool because plant-based it has become this massive trend. People are eating with more mindfulness of their health, of the way animals are treated that are being raised for food, which uh, uh, many, of, most of them suffer unimaginable experiences moment to moment of their lives in their short lives before they're slaughtered. And now the environmental benefits of eating plant-based versus eating a traditional American diet. Uh, so I, I personally lived that life and I've seen how the market has changed recently and I've seen how products also have become much better. And most people, it, we talked earlier about changing habits and, and changing habits are, are really difficult for most people. And it takes a lot of effort. And if you feel you have to make a sacrifice, then that makes it even harder. And so, you know, January 1st, gyms clean up because everyone has these new year, new year resolutions where they want to get in good shape, but many of them, uh, don't stick with what they wanted to do because it's hard if you don't go to the gym regularly to all of a sudden start going five, six, seven days a week. And so most people, after not sticking with it, they, they just lose it and they, and they never even show up at the gym. So the same thing is with, with food. If, if you're eating something, even if you have a good intention, if you want to eat healthier, if you want to eat more consciously from an, an uh, animal welfare standpoint, or if you want to eat to help improve the environment, if you're eating something that is inferior in taste and texture, that's not, a, that's not something that's sustainable. Most people are going are gonna to quit even with the good intention and, and they're going to go back to the way they ate. So I was fortunate enough to get a call from someone who I'm friends with, who used to have a restaurant in LA. I used to go to his restaurant all the time. Uh, it was entirely plant-based. You never saw the word vegan. You never saw the word plant-based. It was just good food. And he was doing things in, in his restaurant on his menu that you wouldn't know the difference between what was plant-based and what wasn't plant-based. And so he had things like a chocolate souffle that you put it next to any regular chocolate souffle and it was exactly the same, light, airy, rose, and a whole bunch of other products that he had made that he, he used in his recipes. And so he was recruited to start a company that ultimately became a billion-dollar valued company. Uh, he left that company and, and led product development at a company called Beyond Meat. And Beyond Meat uh, recently filed to go public. Uh, they, uh, among other products that my now business partner created, his name is Chef Dave Anderson. Uh, he led product development at Beyond Meat for over four years, and he created the Beyond Burger, which has been a runaway phenomenon. It's now sold all across the country and uh, in the meat aisle in a lot of markets. Because if you go where people shop, you, you're not asking them to do something that requires a new habit. You're not asking them to walk past the plant-based meat aisle and say, now shop here. You're going to where they're shopping with a product that looks and tastes and feels very similar to what they're used to. And so when he was thinking about leaving Beyond Meat, Chef Dave, I was a lucky one to get the call. He said, you want to do something? I want to go back to my chef crafted roots. And I said, hell yeah. And that's how Outstanding Foods was born. So we, we started Outstanding Foods and we looked at where we felt we had the best opportunity, where there was a, a, a void in the market. For us, that was bacon. Uh, bacon is a huge market in the U.S., but all of the plant-based bacons are made from things like tempeh or wheat gluten or soy, and they don't taste anything like bacon. They don't have a texture or anything like bacon. So we thought that that was a, a big opportunity for us. And so Chef Dave started developing a bacon strip that tasted like bacon, had a very similar consistency to bacon, but... We knew that if we started with that product, initially it would be a preach to the choir type of product because people would still have to shop for it in the plant-based meat aisle section. It took Beyond Meat years to get in the meat aisle. Uh, so we, we wanted to reach people where they were. And that's how the idea of creating this bacon product into a chip that we're calling pig out bacon chips that are 100% plant-based, 100% gluten-free and taste just like crispy bacon 
that's how that was born. And so we're in the process of rolling it out in a big way. We've gotten approved at Whole Foods. We've gotten approved at Safeway. There's a number of other uh, grocery chains that we're going to be rolling out to progressively. That's going to be our first product. Then we have big plans for making plant-based foods accessible to everyone, not because they're being preached at or judged, but because the products taste great. So your marketing of this is really, really interesting. You've done it very, very differently than most people do this kind of marketing. How how did you how did you think about marketing this in the way that you're doing it now? Like what was your strategy there? We talked about social media, how everything spreads there. And a big reason everything spreads there are through people that are celebrities or influencers. And so th- those people have a platform where uh, their audience is receptive to their ideas and their and the things that they're eating and the things that they're doing in their life and and um, their recommendations and so influencer marketing has become a way that a lot of companies get their their word out but influencer marketing can be extremely expensive if you want to bring a Kardashian into a product as an example they're going to own a big chunk of your company if they're even interested and if you're dealing with even just influencers that you know might be no names to to certain people but have millions of followers to others they're very expensive if you if you if you pay them to endorse your product and in a lot of cases you don't know what the results are going to be and so you spend a lot of money and it's kind of a you know a, a pray and spray hope that that money is going to give you a return and it doesn't always and so we our strategy was we wanted to use influencer marketing but we didn't want to have to pay pay people and hope that it worked. We wanted to get people that were really connected to our brand, connected to our mission to bring plant-based foods to the masses and have them be truly invested in our product and our brand. And the way we approached that was by seeking out influencers and celebrities as investors, because if they're actually investing and believe enough in the opportunity to write a check versus getting a check paid to them for their services, they're going to be not only much more willing to promote it, but much more authentic. Because if you write a check to a company that you believe in, then you're going to you're going to have that authenticity when you're sharing that belief to your followers and to your fans. And so that's how we've approached bringing celebrities and influencers into our company as investors. I love it. Can, how do I get my hands on the bag? All, all you have to do is send me your address and I'm going to send you a, a box of them. <laughs> uh, but yeah, okay. beginning in January, they're going to start rolling out in stores and there's going to be a progressive rollout. The larger grocery chains, they plan their shelf space many months in advance. So the Kroger's and, and other companies uh, like that are, are, are going to be out mid to later in, in 2019, the smaller chains uh, and in some regions of Whole Foods and, and, other, other chains, we're going to be in Wegmans and the East Coast and a, and a bunch of others. Those are coming on uh, as soon as January 2019. And there'll be a progressive rollout where they'll be at stores wherever your listeners are. They can always buy them at pigoutchips.com as well. And we'll, we'll be happy to uh, send a, a, a box to your listeners uh, at, if they go to pigoutchips.com and, and they can order however many bags they want. But we 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 really are hopeful that people are are attracted to our product not because of any mission or any cause or anything else although those are things that our company stands behind but because they really love the product and if they love the product they can not only eat it out of the bag but they can use it in recipes they can make BLTs they could make they use it in mac and cheese they could add it to salads any way you could use bacon you can use our product and we'd love to get your feedback we'd love to get your input so please check out pigoutchips.com, or you can check out outstandingfoods.com to see more about the company and what, what we're up to. I love it. I want to talk a little bit about the other side of your life, which is your non-business side. How would you say raising your daughter is different for you at this age? Great question. So the, you you called out my age to start. And what's interesting... I had to. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, you know, I'm, 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 <laughs> I, I'm, I'm happy about my age and the things that I'm doing at my age because yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't ready for a lot of the things that I'm doing at my age. And, uh, for, for most people, you know, they, they, they use age as a, as a way to measure themselves. You know, where are you at in your twenties, your thirties, your forties, your fifties, etc. And 
that's not the, the best indicator of where you are at your life because everyone's life is different. Everyone's experiences are different. And just because someone is more financially successful in their 20s or their 30s compared to where you might be or because they might have kids or they're married and you might not have those things and you might want them, that's, that's not how we should judge ourselves or measure ourselves. We should measure ourselves by our own happiness and by what we're contributing to the people around us and the people that we have the ability to reach. And so for me, being a, a dad uh, in my, I, I became a dad in my mid forties and, um, in Los Angeles, it might be a little more skewed where, uh, when I went to that first baby prep class, I was definitely not the oldest guy in the room. <laughs> right. I was maybe the median age. And, uh, yeah. but that, that, that seems to be the case all over the country. Uh, maybe a little more skewed in, in Los Angeles, but more and more people are not having kids until they are ready. And it's not just about a financial readiness. You don't need to be a multimillionaire before you have a kid. You don't even need to be you know, comfortable with what you have in the bank. You need to be more emotionally ready to have a kid. And so I, I for me, I wasn't ready in my 30s. I wasn't certainly wasn't ready in my 20s to have a kid. And so I, I feel like this is, the for me, everyone's uh, choice is different. Everyone's place in life is different. And, and for me, to have a child at this age was the one of the best things I've ever done. Not, not one of the best things I've ever done. And so my daughter, while I have a startup and I have a lot of other responsibilities in my life, my daughter is my biggest priority. And so I always make a point to spend time with her every day. I take her to school most mornings. Uh, sometimes I pick her up. My wife and I share that responsibility. And I always put her to bed every night. I mean, just about every night. And if there's if there are nights that I don't put her to bed, then uh, it's it's something that I make up uh, on on other time and spending more time. And for me, you know, it, it's really a lot of people talk about balance, and we all have our personal lives, whether we're married or have a significant other, or whether we have kids or not, or whether we work for a company or have an entrepreneur or or or, or are an entrepreneur. People often talk about balance. For me, balance isn't a certain number of hours I spend on any given thing, whether it's family or business or play or, or those things. I like to have time in each day for those things. But to me, it's more about having the awareness to self-reflect and um, navigate and make changes when I see that I'm imbalanced in certain areas. If I see that I'm not going to the gym because I'm, I'm spending more time with my work, or even more time with my my daughter, then I gain that awareness and I make figure out how I can get up early or how I can fit it into my schedule. And if I feel like I've had too many business dinners at night, then I'm going to change my schedule so I can spend more time with my daughter. And and it's more it's the balance for me is not about every day matching the day before or the day after. It's about making sure that over time that I'm giving the time to the to the things that are important in my life. And not ne neglecting one over the other over time. There, there's always going to be periods of imbalance where uh, you're doing one thing more than others. But uh, over time, you don't want to wake up one day and say, well, I, I spent too much time at the office. Or I didn't spend enough time with my daughter. Or I didn't take care of my body or my health the way I wanted. You, you always want to have awareness so that you can course correct and come back and make adjustments along the way. Yeah, I get asked that question all the time. And my answer is almost identical to yours. And that is, there is no balance. You just put momentum into the areas that you want to put momentum into. That's it. Mm -hmm. yep. you know, love that. What does a typical Saturday morning look like for you? Sometimes it involves me getting up early and going to the gym. And other times it involves me getting up either before or sometimes at the same time as my daughter and making her breakfast and, and then spending time with her and playing with her. Uh, on the weekends, I, I find my times when I work, when my daughter takes a nap in the evenings, sometimes it's during the days. But as an entrepreneur, I feel like I have a mission behind my business. And I feel like I can make a huge impact behind my business. So I don't have days off of my work. But on the weekends, I have more time on with my family and my daughter. I love it. If you could spend one month anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? It would be in Los Angeles and it would be because I love my life and I love everything that I'm doing in my life. And 
I don't want to go away from that. I, I do take vacations. I do get away. I love traveling. Traveling is one of the most enriching things that I could do and that, that most other people can do. And so I, I love to go places, but honestly, I, I love my life and I love my, the, the people that, that are on my team for my company. I love my, my, uh, I should have said my family first, but I love my family. I love my, my, the people on my team. Uh, I love my friends. I certainly, uh, while there's fires and mudslides and earthquakes and all kinds of stuff. I love the, uh, the, the environment of Los Angeles. And, uh, I, I like the life I've, I've created for myself and, uh, I don't want to escape that. And so going on a trip somewhere for a month, I don't view it as an escape. It, it, you know, I've, I've done that before, but if I had anywhere to be, it would be in the life that I've created for myself. Mm, what a great answer. What's the one thing that you've always wanted to do or learn, but you haven't gotten around to yet? Oh, I would love to shred on the guitar. I, I bought a mm. Gibson SG. I grew up, uh, I have very vast musical taste, but I grew up on hip hop and, and hard rock. And I, I like everything now. But when I, was a, when I was a kid, my favorite band was ACDC. And I bought a Gibson SG some years ago, which was Angus Young, the guitar player of ACDC's guitar. I, I had the, 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 the guitar I wanted, the amp I wanted, but I didn't devote the time to learning how to use that thing. And so uh, my daughter, I took her to her first concert recently, and it was Joan Jett. And we were able to meet Joan Jett. And my, my daughter was able to actually go backstage. And Joan was unbelievably uh, hospitable and sweet and generous and giving. And she gave my daughter a guitar pick. And she said, this is, this is going to be something that you could keep as a memory. And my daughter was so taken by that. And my daughter loves music that she asked to play guitar. And I said, is this something you really want to do? And she said, yes. And I got her a mini electric guitar, a pink one. And so we are about to get her lessons and I'm about to get a guitar and learn how to play it. And so that's something I've wanted to do for a while and something I'm about to do. Dude, that is the best answer I've ever heard. And <laughs> I saw that come through on Instagram and... For anybody that um, doesn't follow Bill, go to Bill Glazer on Instagram and take a look at the video of uh, what he just described with Joan Jett. And it was such a beautiful thing because I grew up on the same music you did in the same town. So we have a lot of commonalities. And she sounded to me when she was speaking to your daughter that she was a New Yorker. She had that New York thing. Is she a New Yorker? I don't know for sure, but she's definitely an East Coaster. She's definitely got an, an yeah. East Coast. Like I heard about. it. Yeah. I think she might have grew up in Massachusetts, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, I'm not sure. I get, yeah, I get thrown by the mass accent sometimes. Okay. Let's wrap up with a rapid fire round of questions. Answer as quickly or as slowly as you'd like. It's basically a first thing that comes to mind rounds. What would your friends say is one of your superpowers? So I, it was interesting. I was at a party the other night and someone who uh, introduced me to one of my investors told me what that investor's experience was meeting with me, where he said that uh, he was uh, really amazed at the eye contact that I made while I was speaking with him. And so that to me is one aspect of my superpower of being able to connect with people and to be able to develop and build long-term, mutually rewarding relationships with people. Mm. What's one of the things you're afraid of right now? You know, I, honestly, it's it's exposing in more detail some of my childhood experiences, knowing that there were other people involved. And so, I don't want to I don't want to mm. hurt anyone else by trying to inspire others. And so I, you know, that, that's something that I, I struggle with because, you know, I'd like to get myself out there more and, and share my story and share how I've overcome some really deep rooted fears and, and really deep, uh, struggles to now be someone that has not only gone from being scared to having a meeting with someone to now, you know, having raised, uh, excuse me, hundreds of millions of dollars and, and, you know, having some really long-lasting personal and business relationships. I'd like to tell more of my story, but I, I've honestly been a little bit scared about uh, the consequences of being too detailed for other people. And I've, I've been mindful about that. 
and uh, trying to work that out. What keeps you up at night? Uh, sometimes my daughter still, she still will wake up in the middle of the <laughs> night and call mama or dad out to, you know, help wipe her ass yeah. sometimes or, or yeah. other things like that. But, but you know, I, when, I, when I take on investment from other people and to grow a company that's got a product uh, that, that wants to reach millions of people and, re- and, and make impact with millions of people and, and really, you know, all of the, the intricacies of, of building and growing and running a business. When I, when I take on other people's money, I treat it more safely, securely and preciously than, than if it were my own. And so, you know, while I'm building that business, while I'm putting the brick by brick and, you know, experiencing the challenges, I'm very transparent. I, I talk about the challenges. I talk about how we expect to overcome. And so I, you know, I, I, really value and appreciate other people who have invested in me or invested in companies that I'm involved with to be able to be the fuel in the tank for those companies to grow and for those missions of those companies to reach other people and, and make an impact. And so uh, it, it, it is important for me to do whatever it takes for me to take it to the mat and give those people every opportunity that they deserve. And that sometimes uh, while I'm going through those challenges, I'm thinking of them and I'm thinking about what we could do to make this business or, or whatever thing that I'm involved with that has the backing of other people as uh, successful as it can possibly be for them and for, the, for the, the reason why we started it, to make an impact. What book have you reread the most? The most would be a book called Peace is Every Step by a Buddhist monk named Thich Nhat Hanh. It's a book that is a very simple, easy to understand. It doesn't matter your religion. It doesn't matter your philosophy. It, it gives very simple strategies for the everyday struggles in life, how to be mindful in each moment, whether it's someone cuts you off at a, at a red light or whether you have a challenge with a relationship or whether it's, you're being kept up at night by something that's on your mind, how to, how to rest your mind lots of really practical tools and tips and strategies that anyone can apply. And I've read that book over and over and over again. And I, and I, I used to give it out. I still give it out and, uh, I'll, I'll come back to that book and it does literally give you peace in every step. Mm, I'm going to get it. Okay, great. Let's, uh, let's go into the last question, which is a little bit of a change up. What one question would you like to ask me? What the hell is taking you so long to get to LA, my man? (laughs) (laughs) It's coming, coming, baby. I am almost there. I sold the practice uh, this week, signing the contract on Monday. So, you know, by trade, I'm a chiropractor for the last 25 years. So that part is done. Um, Now I'm moving into the mastermind phase. And the wife and I decided that the Monaco Mastermind is going to be in June and we're doing our annual uh, trip to Greece. So we're going to just stay in Greece and then go to Monaco. And we said, well, we're going to be homeless because we're, where we are in Atlanta is going to be gone. We're in a lease and that's over at the end of June. And we're going to be in Europe for Greece and Monaco. And she said, well, what if, you just, what if we just stayed here until you're Italy mastermind in October. And then we moved to LA. So we're going to do four months in Europe. And then we're going to go straight from Europe to Manhattan Beach in on October 15th. Awesome. That's a, that's I, what a, what a great journey to get to LA. Those are good, uh, <laughs> good, good sidetracks to have along the way. Not your typical cross country journey to Los Angeles, but probably the best one I've ever heard. Yeah, man, I'm excited. Do you have any final words, suggestions, or an ask for the people that are listening? So if anyone listening has a business or is starting a business and wants any tips or strategies how to raise capital, I've raised hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, I've developed certain strategies. I've described how I used to hold myself back. And what I found in raising money is that most people hold themselves back. They think that raising money is something other people do, or they make excuses that are limiting beliefs that to raise money, you need to have an Ivy League education or a rich buddy network or a wealthy family. All of those are just bullshit beliefs. 
And just like anything else, if you believe something and you don't take action as a result, it won't happen for you. And most people, when they start a business, recognize that they need to raise money for it to be successful. And if you look at all of the self-made billionaires, there's just about everyone except one that I'm aware of have all raised money. And so everyone wants to know what Steve Jobs has for breakfast and how Steve Jobs and Barack Obama and Mark Zuckerberg wear the same uniform every day so that they have less thoughts and that they want to know what the workout schedule of billionaires are and and all the all the other habits. But the most the the critical reason why those people became billionaires is because they had the resources to grow their business. If Apple started in the garage with Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, they never would have gotten out of the garage. You we none of us would have iPhones if they never raised the capital to grow the business, to produce a product, to build a marketing team, to sell their product, get distribution, and all those things. So the common trait for most self-made billionaires that they wouldn't have been billionaires had they not raised capital. It's a critical thing for most businesses. If you're a, a, a online marketer and you don't have a, a physical product, you likely don't need to raise money. And there's plenty of other businesses where you don't need to raise money. But if you've recognized that you need to raise money, feel free to reach out to me. Instagram, Bill, at Bill Glazer, G-L-A-S-E-R. Uh, just send me a message, post in any of my, uh, in, in any of the comments, and I'll be happy to give you any tips, input, strategies, that I can impart on you to help you on your journey to being a successful entrepreneur and, and making an impact in whatever you're doing. I freaking love this interview. This was such a great interview. Bill, thank you so much for taking the time. Rob, so appreciate speaking with you. I, uh, it's, it's almost a dream come true to hear your voice for over an hour. It, it's the best voice in podcasting. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Thanks, my man. All right. Thanks for listening. If you love this episode and you know someone that needs some help in either stepping up their work hard game or their play hard game, it would mean the world to me if you shared this podcast with them to help me get this movement out there. So if you like what you heard, head on over to iTunes, take 30 seconds and leave me a five star review and I will be forever grateful. So until the next episode, excuses are over. It's time to live.